I'm going to read the, the uh, email I received from uh, a brother named Julius. And what I want to do is I'm going to read it, and then I'm gonna, we're going to answer the questions in, in this email. So here's feedback, but also the whole reason we're doing this study. It says, hi, my name is Julius. I've been watching a few of your videos lately for the last four days. No, I want y'all to, this is amazing. This guy gets it. I, he's been watching for four days. And I realized that I was not living according to the way Paul is teaching. How about that? Nice. He recognized that at four, four days of watching our videos. And I didn't know anything about grace and truth until hearing you teach it correctly. I actually currently attend an apostolic church. And people fall out as they call it slain in the spirit. Mm. And people seem to be talking in tongue, their tongues. There's even an apostle, as they call him. Been there, done that. The bishop that we went to, the bishop, one day he just came. He says, I'm an apostle now. He just named himself an apostle, okay? Now watch this. He says, you bring up a lot of familiar scriptures that they misuse. So he'll hear scripture that we, I bring up in context, but they'll take out of context to use to, to motivate people. You bring up a lot of familiar scriptures that they misuse. And now I'm unsure about how I feel going there. Hmm. Four, four days, he's like, well, I don't know. I'm going to tell you, Brother Julius, um, it's unprofitable. It's, it's not good. Just keep, you'll get it. Watch this. I've been there too. Like, yep. I can't go to this church anymore. Yep. I tell people if, they, if they're hearing the rightly divided truth of God's grace message through Paul, your own heart and spirit will say, I shouldn't be attending, but keep going. He says, I'm now, and now I'm unsure about how I feel going there. I feel like I need to say something. Yes, you do. Sometimes, sometimes, that's the first thing you do. You go, I have to go and talk to the people there, right? Everybody has that response. All right, here we go. I'm also a musician. I play the bass guitar. Julius, we could use, we could use that. <laughs> we could use that. He, he says, I play the bass guitar. I know you're probably busy, but I appreciate you looking at this email. I have a few questions that I'm curious about. So Julius, yes, he's busy. I get a lot of emails, uh, questions. But because of his number, his questions he have here, I'm going to talk about it today in the next hour because these are questions that I'm sure a lot of people have. And if I get questions that a lot of people have, sometimes I get personal questions and stuff like that. But if I get questions that I know other people, saints have, I'm, I'm going to talk about it. So I'm going to deal with Julius's questions. Number one, in one of your videos, you said that believers have to repent. I'm just wondering, did I hear you correctly when you said that? For example, I just heard the word and I want to follow grace and truth if I were to slip and sin. Not that I go on practicing a sin, but I just slipped up. In other words, he says, I'm not, I don't purposely do it, I just, I'm weak. <clears throat> do I still have to repent or is repenting not something that we do as believers? Number two, what does it mean when it says, but I have to work out my salvation? Great question, by the way, all these great questions. Verse number three, what do, what's the difference between heaven and paradise? Great question. Number four, before I started listening to your videos, I don't believe that I was living in a way according to our Apostle Paul's teachings. Does my old way of living trying to mix law and grace together, does it affect me in any way now, that, now that I want to start following grace and truth? I know that's a stupid question. No, it's not. This is a great question. He was just maybe embarrassed to ask that, but that's a great question because he's thinking, wait a minute. Four days ago, I was thinking this way, living this way. Now I'm starting, the eyes of his understanding are being enlightened, okay? All right, and number five, not that I don't go to church or anything, but is actually attending a church a requirement to go to heaven, okay? And to end it, before we get into the study, he says, these are a few questions I've had since I've been watching your videos. For four days, because because he's curious and his heart desires to please God. OK, watch this. These are a few questions I've I've had. By the way, he's responding the way people should respond. If you're hearing this for the first time, God wants you to be curious about what is this guy talking about? And listen, be open, be re, can, be open to hear the truth, the word of God. Now watch this. 
These are a few questions I've had since I've been watching your videos for the last few days. I, I really enjoy your videos because it helps me understand the Bible in a way I never heard it before. I appreciate that. Thank you so much, Julius. And I share that with Ryan because of his ministry in the Lord of getting these videos out and the rest of you guys for, for having a ministry. This is one of the best emails that I've received. I, I love these. I love this feedback and this, and this encouragement because here's a guy with an honest heart saying, four days of watching your videos, I've never heard it before. He didn't just you know, dismiss them. He really has, he, he, took, he, heard, he took it in and he has questions. So I'm gonna answer his questions today. But I'm gonna do it in this order. The first, the first question, because this is, this is probably the most important one. I wrote these down. Is church attendance required for salvation? Okay. He says in heaven, but is, I'm going to put that in quote, is church attendance required for salvation of your soul? Okay. When I said that salvation, I'm talking about going to heaven, salvation, salvation of soul. Okay. All right. I think you need an apostrophe on your listeners' questions. Well, I did. I had it there, but I mean, all listeners' questions. That's, I, I, let me. Well, I was does that make to sense? There was multiple, but it's just one listener, right? Today. All right. But, but you're gonna, it's my yeah, this is going to be. This is going to be. Thank you, Ryan, for that because I did have it there. I was waiting to see if you were having multiple listeners. Well, you know what? You know what? I actually do though. All right, all let right. me throw this in there. Another guy asked me about the a uh, 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 passage in Matthew. But I'm going to hold that for Prophecy Wednesday. Not All this right. Wednesday, actually. But you know what, Ryan? Thank you for, for reminding me. I appreciate that. This, you're right. If I was just dealing with his question. But the reason I took the apostrophe out is one of the things we're going to do, Ryan and I decided, is that once we go YouTube Live, and he, we were going over the numbers, we get a lot of, we get a lot of views, we get a lot of uh, subscribers and so forth, which is going to increase my workload of answering questions. It's going to it'll probably multiply it by tenfold. And I'm gonna try to answer all the questions, but then we, we're, gonna, we, we, we're working out a system where uh, we, a different platform to have those questions available. So the point is, I'm gonna be dealing, if you're a listener, a subscriber to our YouTube channel, and you have questions, I'm gonna try to, 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 with that increased burden of questions, to answer a lot of them, okay? There's a way that you can give back, we're gonna talk about, but I am going to be dealing more with listeners' questions, people who have questions. It's, it's going to increase. We, can, uh, we, we already look at the numbers. They're going up. And when the numbers go up, like this brother here, Julius, he, he starts watching them. He has all these questions. So, yeah, it'll be listeners' questions. Today it's just his, but in the, in the future it's going to be everybody. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm going to try to deal with everybody's questions in a, in a reasonable time, but we might have to use a different platform we'll talk about later, okay? So that's what it, So his first... His, one of his questions is, I'm going to deal with first is, is church attendance required for salvation? The number two is repentance. Is repentance required for saints? Okay. So his question is, his first question was, did I hear you say, he used the word believers, did I hear you say that believers have to repent. Is repentance required for saints? Okay. For members of the body, we call, we call them saints. That's what God wants us to be. He's, he's making us, he's preparing us to be righteous judges at the, at the great white throne. Number three, what is working out our salvation? What is working out, work out your salvation? Okay. And that's from a passage in the book of Philippians. The Apostle Paul, our Apostle Paul talks about work out your own salvation. We'll deal with that. Number four, is heaven and paradise different or is the same? Is heaven. Today, yes. We'll see, Dodie. We'll see. And, and paradise, I'll say the same. Okay. All right. Dodie's a good, she's, 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 already, she's already thinking about it, ain't you, Dodie? Does my past. Because he asked about the stuff that he, what he was believing, you know, a, a week or so ago before he started watching our videos. 
does my past affect my present? And I'll say even, or future. We're talking about what he believed a week or two ago versus what he's starting to see in scripture now. Okay, all, all of these are good questions. Let's deal with the first one first. When it comes to this issue of church attendance, his question was not that I don't go to church or anything. Remember, he, went to, he, he mentioned how he currently attends an apostolic church. He says, is actually attending a church required to go to heaven? Okay. Is church attendance required? I, obviously, go to heaven means you're saved, okay? That's now, you got it. Church attendance is not required. And what he means, church attendance, means like going to an actual local gathering of, saint, you know, of believers and, and you know, fellowshipping together. With the, with the order of the assembly? Yeah, right? with the order of assembly. We're going to talk about that. because So church attendance in and of itself is not required or mandatory in order to go to heaven. Getting into heaven or being saved, your soul salvation is based upon one thing. And you're right, Dodie. It's not works. It's faith in Christ Jesus. It's trusting the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. That's how you're saved. Your soul is saved from hell. That's how your destiny becomes heaven. If you got saved, in, listen, in your home, in your bedroom, in your bed, listen to radio or watching our videos and hear the gospel of grace, and you never got out that bed and never step foot outside that bedroom and never went to a church, a local gathering of saints, you're still going to go to heaven because it's based upon your faith in Christ. But with that said, attending a local grace church and not just a dispensational church, I must say, okay, although you can, you can, get, you can gain some edification and understanding from a dispensate, Pauline dispensational church, but really what God wants you to have is a grace church. I learned that distinction as we talked about last Sunday. But here's, so I wanted to say this, attending a local grace, Pauline Grace Church is essential to your edification, your sanctification, your walk, and your reward. So is attending an actual assembly required? No. But if, you're, if you want to optimize your edification, build up in, in the faith, your sanctification, taking that buildup of doctrine and walking, pleasing to God so that at the judgment seat of Christ, you can get your full reward. There's no substitute for attending, regularly attending a Pauline Grace Church. Now, if you have a Pauline dispensational church in your area, because because I can't I, I, I've learned over the over the years, not every Pauline dispensational church walks in the grace message. They don't make, they don't make the, the, the big deal about the judgment seat of Christ and what it really truly means to be a joint heir with Christ, the issue like they should, okay? That's between them and the Lord. And that's between the men in that church need to hold whoever the, the leading that church accountable for what Paul is saying and making a huge deal about the judgment seat of Christ. That's why we're living right now. This is for the judgment seat of Christ. At least that was Paul. He pressed toward the mark of the prize, Philippians 3.14. So although church attendance is not required or mandatory in order to go to heaven, attending a local grace church is essential to your edification, sanctification, your walk, and your reward. Now, here's the problem. How many true grace churches are there around? Not many. So we're going to see later that God does take into account such cases because of the unfaithfulness of men who are in ministry to teach Paul's message clearly and, and fully. S Saints are suffering. They're not getting the fullness of what God wants them to have because they're not. A, they have there's a lack of true Paul and Grace churches. What do I mean by that? Go with us, go with me to our passage. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 18. The Apostle Paul just assumes that saints are getting together to hear his message. He, he just assumes that. Look at, look at this passage over in 1 Corinthians 11. 
Do you need to attend a, ch a church, attend a church to go to heaven? No. But does the Apostle Paul want you to be a live, active part of a local grace church? Yes. He just assumes it. If he realized how, how, how bad it was today, which I'll give, you some, I'll give you some proof from Scripture that he could, the Spirit was telling him, man, it's going to be bad. When Paul talks about the perilous times in 2 Timothy, he's not talking about just all the warfares and going amongst the heathen, you know, that type of stuff, the danger. He's talking about there's going to be people who won't have a grace church available to them because men just don't care anymore. That's the perilous time Paul talking about. We'll get to that. Look what he says in our, in our, in our text. 1 Corinthians 11. Look at verse 18. For first of all, in fact, in fact, look at verse 17. 1 Corinthians 11, 17. Now, hey Mark, how you doing? 1 Corinthians eleven seventeen. 17. Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not. Now everybody get this, verse 17. That ye come together not for the better, but for the worse. Notice the Apostle Paul says, hey, when you guys gather together, it was a mess. I don't want you to focus on the mess part. I want you to know, focus on the fact that he, he's saying you guys do gather together. We should be gathering together. Keep, keep verse 18. For first of all, when ye come together in the what? Church. In the church. He's talking about this group, this called out assembly group of believers who came together in a local area. He says, when, first of all, when ye come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you and I partly believe it. Go back to chapter 4. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. So although church, church is not required for salvation of your soul or to get to heaven, attending a Pauline Grace Church is what God wants you to do. Now, we're going to talk about such cases in these last days and how most people don't have that. But God wants that, okay? And those men who God put in the body of Christ to be grace pastors and preachers, but they reject Paul's gospel and, 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 and they say, we're going to do it our way. They're going to, they're going to suffer loss at the judgment seat of Christ. That is 1 Corinthians 3. And for those men who lead dispensation, Pauline dispensational churches, but they don't edify the saints optimally teaching the judgment seat of Christ and what it means to be a joint heir with Christ, suffering with them now, they're going to lose out on reward. This is very serious. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4, what I mean, verse 15. 1 Corinthians 4, 15. For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ. You know what I see there? There, are, there is not a lack of men that God put into the body to teach the Pauline grace message. How come, there, you don't, how come we don't know of 10,000 Pauline grace churches? There should be. I know of two Pauline dispensational churches in the most populated state of California, ours and brothers down in Southern California. Now, I can't speak to whether he is teaching the fullness of God's grace message. That's between him and the Lord and those men who attend his assembly. But what I can do is say that's what we strive to do. Verse number 15, for though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers, for in Christ Jesus I, that's Paul, have begotten you, the Corinthians, Acts 18, through the gospel, and that gospel is a gospel of grace. Now, verse 16, wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. Now, I would say I don't know one Pauline dispensational pastor who doesn't know these verses about following Paul. But following Paul is not just his doctrine. He tells Timothy it's his ways of grace. It's one thing to have the, the, the doctrine. It's another thing to be like Paul and let it live out through you. That's the difference. That's the difference between a Pauline dispensational, dispensational uh, believer and a grace believer, okay? When he says... Be ye followers of me. 
Notice in verse 17, he just says my ways as well. Look at verse 17. For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son. He's talking about his son in the faith. Timothy's father, Acts 16, was a Greek man, but Paul was his spiritual father. And faithful in the Lord. Now, that's what I want you to see. That issue of faithfulness is what's missing today. Faithfulness in men to teach this grace message. Okay, keep going. And I'm going to show you what I think how the righteous judge in such cases will deal with saints. Because there are many people who don't have a Pauline Grace Church in their area. I hear from them every day. That's why Ryan and I, that's why I'm doing this uh, Facebook Live. That's why we, we do, we're going to be doing YouTube Live and why Ryan is, for the past seven years, posting our videos. And we're going to talk more about that because it's not just he just posted. He spends hours doing that stuff even though he has a full-time job. We're going to talk about that. But notice here, verse 17. For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord. Now, what will Timothy do? Watch this. Who shall bring you into what? Remembrance. He, Paul already told him. He says, remind them, Timothy, of my ways. Notice it's not just Paul's doctrine. It's how Paul took the doctrine and worked it out. That's what sanctification is. It's being edified in the truth and walking it out. Watch this. Of my ways which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in what? Every church. Now, there's only one church, which is the body, right? But when he says every church, he's talking about every local assembly. Go over to 1 Timothy chapter number 3. Go to 1 Timothy 3. So Paul, our Lord Jesus, through the apostle Paul, he just assumes you are. Now, again, such cases, because I know Brother Ron, I, would, I get people I hear from, Brother Ron, I wish I had one. I'd be going, I'd be active. I know, I know, I hear from So go over to, uh, what did I tell you? Uh, 1 Timothy. Uh, go to 2 Timothy. I'll show you that one first. Go to 2 Timothy. Chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. Because in such cases, because of the lack of faithful men, God will take that into account. He's the righteous judge. He knows, and I've seen it, I know men who have been exposed to the grace, men in ministry, who have been exposed to this truth, but reject it. Had they received it, they could be teaching other people in their local area. They could be, well, before we look at this, Why they rejected? they're not willing to suffer, suffer. They're not willing to suffer loss now, Dodi. It's not a lucrative thing. It's not a thing where you get rich and famous. It's, 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 a, it's, a, life, it's a life of suffering is what it is. And they're not willing to suffer. Watch this. I did go, go over to 1 Timothy chapter 3, and then we'll look at 2 Timothy chapter uh, we'll look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. <laughs> look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, if you will. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. When Paul's away, he sends Timothy instructions. The book, the book of 1 Timothy, along with 2 Timothy, Titus, and Philemon, they're called the pastoral epistles. That's what they commonly call. Why? Because it's instruction to church leaderships, the pastors, deacons, and so forth, but it's how the church, which is his body, when we come together in local assembly, it's how we operate, okay? Watch this. So Paul wasn't there, so he wrote to Timothy, verse 14, 1 Timothy 3, 14. These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. Paul wants to instruct them in person like he did, okay? But he had other things. He was an apostle. He travels, and then sometimes he was in prison. Verse 15. But if I tarry long, that means if I don't make it there right away, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to, what's that next word? Behave. Behave. Remember, we always talk about accountability. One of the main reasons you meet is not just to be edified and educated and, 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 and grow in, in your sanctification. It's so that you can have accountability. And today, especially with, with technology, the, there's a blessing of technology. People will listen to this right on Facebook Live. They're going to see it on YouTube. But you know what? 
from afar, you can't be held accountable. And what we've seen is that it's real easy just to follow a ministry but not be held accountable to that ministry. It is. And that's why the body of Christ is out of control. Because notice, there's behavior. Verse 15. But if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the what? The pillar and ground of the truth. Paul says in 1 Timothy early in chapter, uh, chapter 2, he says in this same book, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto a knowledge of the truth. And the local assembly is designed to help you build the truth into your life, the truth of God's grace. That's what we're here for. Can you do it from afar to a point? You can listen to stuff, maybe you don't, but, but it, it, you're not optimizing that. And Satan knows that. Can I tell you, Satan, oh, our, Every time I read the word of God, I realize the battle we're in spiritually against the ancient adversary. He knows all this. He doesn't like it when I say this stuff, but he knows this. He knows that if he can make it so that he can't have this, go to, go to 2 Timothy 2. This stuff hits my heart from the moment I became a grace believer because being in ministry, I could see it. It just right there. Look at chapter 2 Timothy chapter 2. Look at verse 1, 2 Timothy 2, 1. In short, he doesn't want you to have a grace assembly to attend. In short, those who have a grace assembly to attend will be held to a higher standard because there are thousands of saints who don't. I'm telling you, I know the righteous judge. There are thousands of saints who wish they had what we had. They will stand in judgment of us who have it and have taken advantage of it. That's how, that's how things work in Scripture. Look at this. Chapter 2, verse 1. Thou therefore, my son. Dodie, you, you, you had the story before we start uh, recording <laughs> of, the, of the man who, had a, who told his preacher, yeah, preacher, I won't be there because it's raining and stuff like that, right? But you'll be there, right? He's like, yeah. The preacher gets there. The guy says, oh, it's raining and stuff, so I won't be there. But you'll be there. Yeah, I'll be there. So if the, the preacher, is he, does he walk on water like he's got? No. He's a human being too, right? If he could be there in his family, why can't others say? This stuff is so important to God. Watch this. It, the body of Christ. Satan knows. He knows. Yeah. Chapter 2, verse 1. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. How can you be strong in God's grace if, you don't, if you're not exposed to it? Verse 2. And the things... Can you get strong without exercising, no. lifting weight? No. In fact, your muscles will atrophy. They will, they will go the opposite. And we're going to talk about something <coughs> about working out your salvation. There's an exercise there. You can't get strong without lifting weights. God, God is showing you that that tension, that growth. Watch this. Verse, <coughs> verse, verse 2. 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. And the things that thou hast heard of me, that's Paul, among many witnesses. He wasn't, out, he wasn't in a closet. He was out in the open. The same, Pauline doctrine, commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. And really the most basic thing I can show you about faithfulness is men who they're always there. They're reliable. They're reliable. They're there. You guys couldn't trust me if, you know, two out of every uh, four Sundays in a month, I'm staying home watching the Bears lose. I'll see y'all next week. You're like, what the, where, where's Brother Ron? He's sitting home watching the ball game. We need you. Yeah, I know. Listen, faithfulness. And what I, what I want you to see is that Satan knows all he has to do is get men not to be faithful, especially the guys who are supposed to be teaching this stuff, and he can destroy the body. He does. He knows that. He, 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 he lives for that. Go back to chapter, first, first Timothy chapter four. Go back to first Timothy chapter four. Look at verse one. First Timothy chapter four, verse one. First Timothy four, one. Now the spirit speaketh expressly 
that has to do with, with urgency. This is the Spirit of God. That in the latter times, that's the times where we live in these last days of God's grace, some shall depart from the faith. That's what Satan wants people to not to listen to the Apostle Paul, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, telling you one thing, but then they won't do it. Having their conscience seared with a hot iron, they've been, they've been so going against this truth that now they become numb to it. Verse, and then he talks about different things, forbidding to marry and co commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth and so forth. Paul goes on to talk about different things that Timothy had to deal with as well. But what I want you to see is that, go back, go over to uh, chapter, 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter number 3. And boy, if this hasn't happened, I don't know what has in Scripture. I see this every day now. Verse, verse 1, 2 Timothy 3, 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Now, mind you, when Paul talks about these troublous times, it's not, he's not talking about all the death and destruction and killing amongst the heathen that we're exposed to in this christ judgment world. He's talking about things that are happening in the body, and the perilous times is you're going to have a lack of faithful men, and it's going to be a mess out there in the body, a mess. And y'all know it's that way now. Look at this. Verse 1, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, man, covetous, Boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, without self-control, fierce, fierce like beasts and so forth, despisers of those that are good. They don't even like those who are good. Traitors, they turn on you and stuff, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Brenda, you were talking about the guy who says, I'm going to get my wife a Lamborghini. What's that for? That's just the vanity of the flesh. That's just pleasures, right? He's Look a at, too. Yeah, a pastor. A pa that's right. That's, sorry about that. You're right, Ryan. Who was that guy? It was just some dude. But it was just, we were just talking, it, the ridiculousness of that. But that's lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Really? You couldn't, that, that money you're extorting through tithes, you couldn't put to better use than to buy your wife a Lamborghini? If he bought, if a pastor brought his wife a Lamborghini, what'd he drive? A Bentley or something? I mean, look at that. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Verse 5. And you got the word proud in there. In yeah. this current year, it's been redefined as something not evil. So exactly. People think pride, being proud or being pride is a, having pride a good, is a good thing. Good thing. Crazy. And that, that's part of the, the perilous opposite, times. The yep. opposite of what the Bible says about pride. And look at this. Remember, he was a pastor. Verse 5. Having a form of godliness, outwardly, he's a pastor and, you know, he's a church and stuff. But denying the power thereof, that's the power of God's grace message. From such, turn away. You don't listen to them. You turn away from them. And women, sisters, you have to be especially careful because he, they use the same tactic Satan did. For of this sort are they which creep into houses. Now they do it through technology especially. Ryan calls them creeps. Creep into houses and lead captive silly. Silly as in naive, weak, they're the weaker vessel. And just, they just take advantage of them. They lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lust, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Mm -hmm. and, and what Satan has done, especially with the sisters in the Lord, I see it. He has given them an outlet so they can to be the opposite of being discreet, social media. There's not, there's not one place in scripture where God tells women to correct men spiritually. I see sisters in the Lord do it every day on social media, out of control. Satan sin, we love it. That's the perilous times Paul is talking about, the frustrating, dangerous times for the body. And God and Paul are trying to get people to, look, go over to, um, go over to Ephesians chapter 4, We've got a couple more verses. So although having, uh, attending a church is not required to go to heaven or for salvation of your soul, attending a Pauline Grace Church is the way you can optimize your reward. And for those of us who have a Pauline Grace Church, we need to take advantage of it because God is looking at 
all the saints who desire to have it, but because of lack of faithful men, have none in their area. You're really selling yourself short if you're not taking advantage of that opportunity. Or selling that, yourself short. You're not that, taking advantage. The equipping yep. that the Lord wants for you as a, a member of the body of Christ. It's right. We're about to look at that. Listen, we've had people travel across country. Now, I know everybody can't do this. For different. I talk to people, different home situations, life situations, family situations, uh, work situations. Like, but for those, we've had people travel across country because of the lack of having a grace church in there. They said, we got to get to NorCal Grace. And Dodie, you're looking right back at Craig there. That's right. He, see, Craig didn't mess it up for everybody else in my mind. <laughs> He didn't, he didn't mess it up for everybody else. What, what percentage of those excuses do you think are just excuses? 90. 90%? That's what I was thinking, too. Yeah. Especially when it comes to the men. Mm -hmm. It's like, where are you? Get here. The Lord Jesus, when he was on earth, and he's calling out men to go and be his disciples and go with him from town to town preaching the gospel, men would come up and say, he says, Lord, I just bought some oxen. I haven't used them and tested them yet. He just looks at them. Okay, fine. Lord, my, my father, I got to honor my father. He's sick at home and stuff like that. God, the Lord says, I'm, I'm God and that's your father. He said, let the dead bury the dead. He was saying, you got all these excuses, but hey, here we go. He says, no man who is fit for the kingdom puts his hand to the plow and starts going and then looks back. He said, are you with me or not? Let's do this thing. Because the time is short. You're either going to find a solution or find an excuse. Yep. Now, again, the Lord is a righteous, just, and, 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 and merciful Lord. So there are such cases. But if in your own life, you look at your life honestly before the Lord and says, you know what? I better take it back. Why do you think he has we, us talk about this stuff? The time is short. The day is at hand. Check your priorities. Man. Look at this, because watch what I show you from Ephesians chapter number four. As Paul talks about the you look at chapter four, verse three. Endeavoring to keep the unity. That's one of many in one. The unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. And he talks about how God has put different people in the body. But but uh, verse verse um. 15, speak, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Why does God want the local assembly? So that it could be the pillar and ground of the truth. You speak that truth in love, which will help us all grow in Christ. Look at the next verses. I love this. Christ, from whom the whole body, that's the body of Christ, fitly, Join together. Now, let me show you what that's like. <laughs> Little boys like these things like Legos, right? Legos. And you can build and you snap those suckers in together. That's what that's the sense of it. And you can't be snapped together like Lego set if you're everywhere and not together. You get that? There's nothing worse than having a bunch of Legos on the floor all in disarray and you step on them and hurt your feet and stuff. <laughs> But them little boys put the things they make and, and, and they use their creative mind to do this stuff. It's good for those little guys. But that snapping together, compact. I think about like Voltron, like the different robots. Oh, yeah. Together. I like that, right? Yeah, robots. the Voltron back in the day. That's right. Yeah. Look what it says in verse 16. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted. You know what a compact is? You know if you go to a junkyard where they have cars. Or you can even do it with trash. Like they pick up the trash at our place, they throw it in there, and then this thing goes and squash all the trash down, make more room. He just press all the air out. And the sad part, some people have been caught and been put in there. Somehow they were in the trash can and fall asleep or something or drunk. And the guy stops the compact because it'll smush, smush them, right? Or you, I love seeing when you watch uh, cars, they pick them up with these big magnets and drop them in there and then they smash. They could take a car and make it like a cube. And that's what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. Smash. And that's that word compacted. By that, now how do you get this tightness? By that which what? Every joint supplieth. That means you matter. You matter. Every joint. Every joint supplieth. And if you're not supplying, you're negatively impacting what God's trying to do in the body of Christ. By the way, 
Every Pauline dispensational teacher should be teaching these things. You don't hear this in a lot of them. You definitely don't hear it in denominations. Look at that. Every joint compacted, joined together by that which every joint supplieth. And it's according to or in line with the effectual working in the measure of how many parts? Every part. Do you not see that we all play a part? I hope you don't see yourself as, oh, I have no part to play. By the way, for those who don't have church, faithful churches, we're going to see this when we go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8 in our study. Paul says there's two ways that those saints could help them. Like Epaphras, who would pray. If you're not with us in person, you can pray. That labor together in prayer. And the second way is giving. Paul says, you pray that they accept this, and, they, and they, he's, he's going to commend these poor, poverty stricken saints on their giving to help the ministry. That's the only way you can help from afar. It's fruit abound to your count. But for those who do have your presence and so forth, notice verse 16, from whom the whole body fitly joined together. I want everybody to read Ephesians 4, 16. Just read it a hundred times and think about it. From whom the, by the way, because Satan knows this, everybody, that's why he tempts the men who can teach, who should be teaching the Pauline Grace message. He tempts them with all type of other things to not get them to suffer for it and teach it. Because he knows the strength in numbers when it comes to saints. Verse 16, from whom the whole body, you remember that, fitly joined together. You have to be that with them and compacted. By that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part. Everybody plays a part. Everybody has something to contribute. And what does it do? Making, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. It builds up the body. You play a part in the strength of the body of Christ. You do. We all play a part in the strength of the body of Christ. You may not see your, that of yourself, but when you're here or when people listen to this, if they don't have, it so encourages my heart, the heart of my parents, the heart of my family, obviously, and the heart of other saints. You know that? Just your presence. But most people, they don't see this. They don't care. It's sad. The body, it, we live in these perilous times, but I want you all to see that. Couple more. Go to Colossians chapter two. Go forward to Colossians chapter two. And it's frustrating in ministry when I see these things as a Pauline Grace minister. I see them in Scripture, but they aren't manifesting in its fullness in reality. And it it, it hurts. And then I think, if it hurts my heart, what is? How does God's heart feel? Yeah, it hurts his heart too. It grieves. It, it grieves them. Dodie, that's the word. He says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, right? Yeah. It grieves the Holy Spirit who's with us, okay? Look at Colossians chapter 2, <laughs> verse number 2. Start at verse 1 for context. Colossians 2, 1. For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you. And for them at Laodicea, that's a, a region near Colossae. And for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. Those will be other saints who have never met the apostle. That their hearts might be comforted. You know what his conflict was? He knew as he's in prison, he knew that by getting to them, it would comfort them. Face-to-face -face contact comforts one another. Watch this. Verse 2, that their hearts might be comforted, being what? Knit together in love. You ever seen a knitting? One of the, one of the blessings of, of working with senior ladies in their 90s and so forth for those five years when we moved here, I took a lot of these women to, to these stores to buy their knitting, uh, that knitting equipment, and they would knit stuff for us. If I was still there, I had me a nice Christmas sweater. I'm sure one of them would knit for me, right? And when you watch them do that, they'll be sitting at their doctor's appointment, and they just, it, this real intricate knitting, 
And all they keep doing is interlocking, interlocking. And every time I saw them do that, I say, that's that verse. Knit together. How can you do that if you're not together? Knit together in love. And unto all riches of the full. Now, this is why you need the local assembly, because this is the only way you're going to get it. And unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God. That's the prophetic program. The mystery of the Father, his plan for heaven and earth, and of Christ. That's for the heavenly places, the mystery of Christ. And, and, and in him is all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You see that issue of knitting. One more, verse 9. I'm sorry, verse 19. Colossians 2, 19. And not holding the head, speaking of these guys who don't preach Paul's gospel, from which all the body, now watch this, by joints, and bands, you know how the inner workings of your physical body, the joints and the, and, and the, the ligaments and things like that, that bands are ligaments? Mm -hmm. He's saying the same way your body gets nourished, the blood and the marrow and all the stuff, all the stuff that makes your body work, he says that's how the body of Christ should work. Listen, if they, if they took your hip out, man, and your ligaments out, you wouldn't walk too well, would you? No. You wouldn't be able to stand up, let alone walk. If, if they took your hip out and didn't replace it and your joints out, ligaments. I watch football players every, every Sunday. Some football player has a ligament tear. He gets hit the wrong way. His knee hyperextends. And they, these strong young guys in their 20s can barely walk. And they, they out for like a year because they, their, their, their ligaments, their bands tore. And they got to get it replaced. Bo Jackson, I met the guy who we were talking about Bo Jackson last, last week. I met the guy who took Bo Jackson down. The best athlete i ever seen in my life met him, Bo Jackson. One guy he pulled him on his leg and pulled his hip out of joint. Bo never walked the same again, man, strong as he was. I met that guy at a Grace Conference in Chicago years ago. He said to this day, he, he felt so bad. It, it was, it, he was just doing his job. He was a, he was a linebacker. But it, it, it messed him up because he says, I, 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 mess, I helped slow down Bo's career just doing my job. But he's saying his, his, his knee, his, his hip came out and it never was the same again. That issue of joints, uh, go down to verse 19, and not hold your head from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment, that's where it receives its nourishment, ministered and knit together, increaseth with the what? You want the increase of God, it's we all play a part. So is church attendance required for, to go to heaven or for salvation of the soul? No. That's faith in Christ Jesus alone. No works. Dodie was right. It's a work. But it is a good work if you do attend a Pauline Grace Assembly. There are such cases because of lack of faithful men. You don't have one in your area. Some people can take that extra step and get here like Brother Craig, other, that's between you and the Lord, but you think about it and prayerfully consider it between you and the Lord. If you absolutely can't, Paul says there's two ways that you can help. Labor together in prayer and give to support the ministry. It's fruit abounding your account. That's what Paul says right there. Now, with the time we have left, I'm going to talk about this one right here, and we'll pick up the next one. I'll, I'll, I'll extend it next Sunday if the Lord tarries. Is repentance required for the saints? Because that's his first question. Now, this issue of repentance, I want to define it by how the scriptures define it. Because the way that denominationalism, and I know if this brother is in an apostolic church, the way they define repentance is not the way the Bible does. They have one definition for repentance, and that is turning away from your sins or, you know, stop sinning, as it were. Okay. But the problem with that when it comes to repentance in Scripture, go with me to Genesis chapter number 6. Go over to Genesis chapter number 6, the first time the word repent is used or in, that, in that capacity. Go to Genesis chapter number 6. After the Lord made man in chapter 1 and 2, we're at the time where he's about to bring the flood because of man's evilness from their youth up. And, and Dodi, you mentioned earlier about you can grieve God, right? God has a soul. He can be grieved. And, and this is the first time we see where God is grieved recorded in Scripture. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. 
And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Read that a few times and think about that. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. Now notice if the only definition of repentance is being sorry for your sins or stop sinning, sorry for your sins, that type of stuff. This verse and many others would have the Lord himself sinning. Because there it says it repented the Lord. But when it comes to the word repent, we're going to see there's different definitions of it depending on the context. Now I'm going to write this down. There are times in context where the word repent means a change of mind. You change your mind. There are other times in context it means to change direction. Change, uh, change direction. To basically, to turn. To turn. Like turn. You're going in one way, you change direction. Turn. Okay? A third one. A change in action. You change actions. I went through all the verses, and, and these are the things that come up in the context. Um, there's a sense of regret or remorse. Regret <coughs> slash remorse. And another one, and you see it in this one, disappointment. That's this one. He was disappointed. And it says it grieved him in his heart. In this one, the Lord was di disappointment. And there's one more apologetic. I tried to, I look at uh, uh, apologetic. I looked at all the verses that used repent, repentance in some sort. And with mine, I've come up with this. This is, this is all of them. The one from Gen by the way, most of the reference to repent or repentance in Scripture have to do with the Lord himself. You would think if the way that it's taught in denominationalism or religion, repent means to turn from sin or stop sinning or being sorry for your sins, why would most of the, why would most of the uh, references to repent? I know why. Satan wants you thinking that repentance simply means stop sinning. What better way than when you read about repenting the first time you read it and th throughout scripture, it's in reference to the Lord himself. Satan wants you to think the Lord is sinning. How about that? Watch this. Go over to Exodus chapter 13. You in Genesis? Look at Exodus. Ex Exodus 13. By the way, the first one that we saw in Genesis 6, 6, it repented the Lord that he made man. He was so totally disappointed. As, do you have, if you have children, you know disappointment, don't you? Yes. Yeah. Oh, you said, yeah, I'm your son. <laughs> My mother yeah. shouted out, yes. Sorry, mother, for disappointing yes. me. Look at, yes. oh, you want, yes. boy, you don't talk about that, boy. <laughs> That's my father back then. <laughs> no, I'm sure. I was a child. I disappointed. I know I, know I did when I told you to put that broom down when I was 15. I'm sorry, mom. It still bothers me to this day. It's okay. It's okay. Thank you, Dodie. Dodie's my other mother. My second one. But if you have children, you understand disappointment. So when God looked at man and he says, I made man in my image and this is what I'm getting out of him, he was disappointed. That was that. It repented that he made man. He went, disappointed in them. It hurt him. Okay? But that's not the only one. Like I said, most of the references to repent is the Lord himself. Look at Exodus chapter 13. Exodus chapter 13, if you will. I better get there myself. Exodus 13. And look with me at verse 17. Exodus 13, 17. And it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines. Now, this, is, this has to do with the, 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 the people of Israel. I'll, I'll get some more. Although that was near, for God said, lest per adventure the people repent when they see war and they return to Egypt. God says you can go this way, but there's going to be 
armed forces waiting on you. So he took them the long way. Because he says, they were ready to go back too. Uh, yes, they were. See, this one, you can, in their minds they were ready, but he said they were going to go that way and say, oh no, we're heading back, right? They're going to just change direction, okay? They were heading this way to the promised land. They saw war and said, oh, nope, we're going back to Egypt. By the way, Dodie, you're right. Many times they wanted to go back to Egypt, right? They forgot the type of bondage they were in. Right. They forgot that. Yeah. And God had to keep reminding them. Um, but that, that one's for the people of Israel. Um, I got a couple more. Exodus 32. Go over to Exodus 32. And I'll give you guys these references because I, I can't, with time sake, we can't go through all of them. Exodus 32. Look at verse 12. Exodus 32, 12 through 14. Oh, this is a good one. This is a good one. Okay. Exodus 32, 12. Moses is kind of re rebuking the Lord. And I'm just saying that with ex like this. He, God is testing Moses, and Moses is giving God what, what, what he's looking for. Verse 12. Because God says, you know what, Moses? These people are disappointing me. I, forget that. Sorry. They're making me mad. I'm hot at them. I'm going to destroy all of them, Moses, and I'll start over with you. God could have done that. But Moses is thinking, nah, God, because if you destroy your people, people already think that you want to bring them out to destroy them anyway. So don't give, he's saying, don't give your enemies the satisfaction of that. And God is like, okay, you're thinking, Moses. I'll deal with my mercy, in my mercy with these fools. So watch what Moses says to God to get them not to kill the people and start over with Moses. Start at verse 10. Oh, for verse 9, we got to get it. Everybody got Exodus 32, 9? And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it's a stiff-necked people. Like a, like a yep, like an a, like a, a ass in the Bible that needs his neck broken. Stubborn. Stubborn. Verse 10. Now, therefore, let me alone. You know what he's saying? Don't intercede for them. Did you all know that God told Jeremiah? Don't pray for these people. There are times when God says, they're so bad, don't even pray for them. Let me at him. Verse 10. Now, therefore, let me alone that my wrath may wax hot against them and that I may consume them and I will make of thee a great nation. Moses, I'll start over with you. I'll still I'll still fulfill my promise to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. I'm going to do it with you. I'm going to kill the rest of them. Verse 11. And Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? And here's Moses' reasoning. He says, don't give those enemies anything, any upper hand on this. What, verse 12. Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, ha, huh, for mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth. And watch what Moses tell God, tells God. <laughs> Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Moses said, look here, Lord. Repent of the evil. Now, the, the question might come up, what does he mean, repent of the evil? Because God says when it comes to Israel based upon a covenant <coughs> called the law of Moses, he made that covenant in Exodus chapter 19 and 20. According to that covenant, if they, if they obeyed God, he blessed them. Leviticus chapter 26, Deuteronomy 28. But if they disobeyed God, he would what? Curse them and bring evil upon them. He would bring evil. That was the law. That was the law because people see that in Isaiah. I am the Lord. I create good and I create evil. So it says, ah, he's a bad God. Ha, 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 right? But he does that with Israel because he has a covenant with them. And so when he says, repent of this thy evil, he's asking God, please change your mind, Lord. He's not saying God is sinning. He's saying, please change your mind. And what I'm saying is you're going to see this. You can, I'll give a few more. Uh, I'm just going to put them out there. Deuteronomy 32, 36, Judges 2, 18, 1 Chronicles 21, 15. Famous one, Acts 2, 38, Peter tells Israel to repent, right? Let's go to that one because this is the one religion goes to. Go over to Acts, Acts 2.38. I've got about 10 minutes. Acts 2.38. 
because this is the one his apostolic church uses. I know. How do I know? They all use it. The apostolic, this, this, the, the apostolic succession. Interesting, they're, they're the succession from the 12 apostles and not the apostle Paul. Isn't that interesting? Acts 2.38, Peter speaking to the men of Israel. Verse 37, Acts 2.37. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. They were convicted and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? How do we get out of the wrath of God? Verse 38. Then Peter said unto them. Now, who are the them in context, everybody? Ye men of Israel that he starts chapter two with. Okay, let's keep going. Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Repent. Change your mind about who Jesus Christ our Lord is. Notice their remission of sins wasn't them stop sinning. The Holy Ghost was going to help them do that. The repentance here means change your mind about who Jesus Christ is. Is he the Son of God or is he not? The Jews didn't believe he was the son of the Christ, the son of the living God. When, when Peter preached to him by the power of the Holy Ghost sent down in Acts 2, he says, if y'all want to get out of the wrath of God, you need to change your mind about who Jesus Christ is. Accept him as the son of the living God and you'll receive remission of sins. OK, now that's that's the sense that most denominationalism Christendom has the Acts 238 repentance. But what this brother asked me is. Is repentance required for saints today? He's talking about members of the body of Christ. Now, he's only been watching us for four days, so I'm sure that would have been hard for him to grasp what I was saying. But when it comes to saints who are living a lifestyle of sin, repentance is a requirement for saints who are living a lifestyle of sin. And what this repentance is, depending on the context Paul is dealing with, we'll see over in 2 Corinthians, a change of mind, change of action, regret and remorse, because you've been calling God a liar. He says, no, no, no. What, this is it. Yes. Apologetic. Saying, Lord, we were wrong. You're right. That's what God is looking for, a change of heart. Change of heart. I can put that right there. Yes. Now, and actions, by the way. By the way, the repentance Paul talks about is all these things. <laughs> he even wants you to be disappointed. This is not who I am in Christ. You everybody see that? I'm going to show you that. Now, when it comes to members of the body of Christ, go with me, if you will. Second Corinthians. We're going to look at some passages. Second Corinthians 7. Now, eventually, we're going to get there in our, in our 2 Corinthians study, but I want to go over a few of them right now for the, for the, for the brother who asked the question. Now, next time, next Sunday, we're going to look at this. What is work out your salvation? Is heaven and paradise the same? And does my past affect my present and future when it comes <clears> to the Lord? We didn't get time to get to them, but we're going to talk about those, okay? You got you to be here to get it. Now, we're going to look at this with the time we have. This is an excellent question. When I got them, I said, I got to share this with everybody. Every once in a while I get questions, I go, other people got these questions. And the fact that this guy's only been watching our videos for four days and he got these questions, his heart's right before God. He, you know how you know? He, he does. These questions had him pondering, am I walking in this truth? I read it to you guys. All right. Look with me, if you will. What did I tell you? Um, 2 Corinthians 7. Go over to 2 Corinthians 7. The Corinthians were walking in sinfulness. They were the carnal Corinthians. So the Apostle Paul has to deal with them. Again, we almost at this passage in our weekly study, so I'm not going to get into it too much. I'm a, but he wrote a letter to them to get them to repent. Notice this. Yeah, we're going to start at uh, verse 8, if you will. Thank you. 2 Corinthians 7, 8. But though I made you sorry with a letter, he wrote to them 1 Corinthians they had regret, remorse. They wanted to make things right. He says, verse 8, for though I made you sorry with the letter, I do not repent. Interesting. 
Was Paul writing 1 Corinthians sin? No, it was the will of God. It was the Holy Spirit who wrote it. Which one is that? He says, I don't regret it. I made you sorry as a father. I hate to see my children so feel bad, but I don't regret it. Okay, keep going. Verse 8, for though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. Though I did repent. He was thinking, he said, it wasn't easy for him. He had some remorse in his heart. He, didn't, he, didn't, he, he, didn't, he wished he didn't have to do that. You understand that as a parent. If you have to discipline your child with corporal punishment, physically spank them, it hurts your heart. That's a true thing. It's just going to hurt me more than hurt you, son. Because no parent wants to have to do that, but sometimes you do. He says, verse 8, for though I made you sorry with the letter, I do not repent. Though I did repent. So he, he had some second thoughts. For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it, it, though it were but for a season. Notice, he wanted them to get to the point where they had remorse, that they disappointed him, and that they were going to be now apologetic, okay? It worked. By scolding them in 1 Corinthians, 5, uh, 1 Corinthians he got them to change their ways. Let's keep going. It was just for a season. Verse 9. Now I rejoice, not that ye were made sorry. The goal wasn't to just have them sad. When you spank your child, is it so that they can sit wheezing in the corner crying and stuff? No. It's to correct them. Exactly. Make them correct them. So that's what Paul is saying. Now I rejoice, not that, not that ye were made sorry, but that you sorrow to what? Repentance. So the answer to the brother's question is, is repentance required for saints, not for their salvation, but to, but to correct their walk with God, yes, if they're living a sinful lifestyle. Now, here's the only caveat. There's a difference with God between weakness. That's going to come up when I read his fifth question, does my past affect my present? Make sure you listen to that. Because the issue of weakness, if you're, if you're, if you're overtaken in a fault, Galatians 6, and you're living a sinful lifestyle out of weakness, the righteous judge takes that into account. But if it's out of willfulness and you don't care about what God says in his word, that's rebellion. And that's the guy in 1 Corinthians 5. And you know what God did to him? He had Satan whoop up on that dude, and that dude came crying to God. Listen, God don't play. The prodigal son, he says, oh, you want to live that lifestyle? It beat the hell out of him, literally. Beat the hell out of him. He came back crying to his father. God, God has a way of humbling and humiliating people in their rebellion. Just let Satan have it. Now, we, 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 we're coming down the end, but we're going to look at the next three and ne next week. Now, watch what he says here. Verse 9. Now I rejoice, not that ye were made sorry, but that you sorrow to repentance. See, yes, saints can repent. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner. It was a godly thing in this case that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. What was that damage? <clears throat> what type of damage would, would they receive had they continued in their rebellion? Loss at the judgment seat of Christ. And Paul, when he gave that guy over to Satan, he says that the spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Listen, you would rather suffer loss now. Why don't we have faithful men preaching a Pauline grace message? Because they would rather suffer loss now they, they rather suffer loss now. They, they don't appreciate the loss they're going to suffer. The damage. See that damage? Watch this. Verse 10. For godly sorrow worketh repentance. See, if it's godly sorrow, how do you get godly sorrow? The word of God motivates you. It's from the word of God. Listen, I can tell you this as a grace preacher. I hear people put religion and put such bonds on people, such bonds bondage on people having them feeling guilty about stuff that God never felt had them be guilty about. We were talking about in our Q&A about the Catholic religion and all these other religions and they, they done, if you grew up in that stuff it messed you up man and it's got all these bonds that God didn't put on you. But if it's godly sorrow for sins that God actually calls it. Ryan has a question he's a beautiful question he says what, when you talk about something to God, what sin is that? What sin is that? Like, 
You can't just say, I feel this and I feel that. You got to say, but what sin would that be from the Apostle Paul's or the word of God, right? That's a good question. Because your flesh could feel like you letting God down and God is looking at you. I, I didn't tell you to feel that way about that. Religion told you that, right? Or your own self. Let's keep going. Verse 10, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. Now, that's not soul salvation. What salvation? Yeah, well, to save you from damage at the judgment seat of Christ. Loss of reward. I can tell you all in my experience in, in dispensational circles, a lot of my dispensational brothers don't talk about this stuff, guys. You know what they do? They do topical messages here and there. You could do a topical message for the next 50 years and not touch on any of this. Mm -hmm. Can I tell you, I didn't hear much of this stuff when I, in my first seven years in the grace message. We talk about his water baptism uh, requirement. Who's our apostle? It wasn't until I said, okay, Lord, I want to dedicate my life to you and help people understand your word through the apostle Paul that I start seeing this, the eyes of my understanding being light. And I say, I got to tell people this. And sometimes my own brethren in dispensational circles get mad at me because I'm seeing these things. But what am I supposed to do? Care about what they say or care about the Lord? Every saint should be hearing this. You know why this brother had this question? Because nobody taught him about this stuff. So I'm, I'm, I'm teaching. Look, notice. They felt guilty because they didn't do it. I don't, even, I, I don't even think they felt guilty, though, because I just think not every dispensational Preacher is a Pauline grace preacher. I, they just don't spend enough time in Paul's epistles. And by doing topical messages, you're going to miss a lot. By doing topical messages, you're going to miss a lot. Next week, I'm going to read this email I got this week. Somebody says, you know what, Ron? I see that why you teach verse by verse through Paul's epistles. Because that's the only way I'm going to understand the stuff that I'm going to be judged on, how to live today and be judged tomorrow. I said, you got it. And if you're just doing topical messages every week, you miss the, 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 the meaty, meaty stuff. Okay, we got to end, though. I got two minutes. Let's go. Okay, so wrong. So go ahead, Paul. Is repentance required for saints? Yes, if they're in, living a lifestyle of sin. So they need to change their actions. They need to do all of this right here. Yep. And allow the word it's of God. Not, it's not required for salvation. No. For salvation. Not of your soul. Right. Salvation from hell, you mean? I just want to make that clear. It is required, though, if you don't want to suffer damage at the judgment seat of Christ. Mark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay? And next week, I'll pick, up, I'll, I'll, I'll pick up right here because I want to show you what it means to repent. Well, I, I'm going to go. Let me read the verses, and then I'll pick up, I'll pick up right there next week, okay? Because okay. we didn't have time. I had to deal with the other stuff. Because it's in this passage. Here we go. Verse 10. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation... Not of your soul, but the, the salvation that he says in 1 Corinthians 5, that the spirit may be saved, saved from damage at the judgment seat. Okay, keep going. Verse 10, for godly sorrow work of repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. See, not to be repented of. This, God, this one you won't have regret. You'll never regret saying, man, that was close, almost lost reward. You'll never regret the fact that you recovered yourself. Remind me to end, Dodie, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, okay? Don't let me not go there. All right. Verse 10. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. You never regret it. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. What's the sorrow of the world? It's this type of stuff. You grow up in Catholicism. You grow up in some other religion. And they put all these bonds and these, and these legalistic uh, things to make you feel guilty. And it drives you. It puts this burden that God didn't put on you. And it drives you to death. That's of the world. You are sorry for God. Oh, God. But it's, it's stuff that God didn't put on you. That's that. Verse 11. For behold this same. Okay, okay. For behold this self same thing. That you sorrowed how? After a godly sort. You let the word of God and, and the provision he put there motivate your sorrow. Now here it is, Mark. And I'm going to pick this up next week, okay? Here. I'm going to go through it in detail. What carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of your cell. So Mark, look at me, Mark. When we go over this next week, I'm going to start in 2 Corinthians 7-11, and I'm going to break every one of these down because that's a great. I want you to see 
What does it mean? His question is, is repentance required for the saints? Not for salvation, but for, to, to not lose reward. But I want to show you what it looks like, okay? I'm going to explain all these. Yea, what clearing of yourselves, verse 11. Yea, what indignation. Yea, what fear. Yea, what ve vehement, excuse me, vehement desire. Yea, what zeal. Yea, what revenge. In all things ye have approved yourself to be what? Clear. Clear in this matter. Listen, until you deal with that rebelliousness, you're guilty before the Lord. But just like anyone, because God gives space to repent, he gives you time to clear the debt, okay? So if you were talking to somebody in the body who was living that lifestyle, your, your argument would be, hey, you're going to lose out. I, I couldn't find a greater argument from the Apostle Paul. Could not. And I would explain to them just what I mean about the, the terror of the Lord. Like, we'll talk about that in a minute. And the, the prescription to remedy that would be get the word in your inner man, be part of the local assembly and the order of the assembly yep. to get that taken care of. And, and that's where all of this clearing will take place. So we'll, we'll, pick, we'll pick that up on the next one. I want to I want to look at two. I, I told Dodie to have 2 Timothy 2 for me. But I also want uh, 1 Timothy 5 on the way. Stop at 1 Timothy 5. And we'll end in 2 Timothy 2. Go to 1 Timothy 5. Why, why does God give space? Why does God require repentance? Not for salvation, but for uh, uh, so you might not have damage or loss of reward. Because your sin, that, that, that sinful lifestyle is going forth. Look at first. By the way, my brethren in the, in the Pauline Grace, this is a pastoral epistle. Every pastor should be teaching this. Look at 1 Timothy 5. Verse 24, 1 Timothy 5, 24, some men's sins are open beforehand, and where do they go? Going before to what? It's going to the judgment seat of Christ, man. That stuff is going there. But what about the guys who do it in secret? Verse 24, some men's sins are open beforehand, going before the judgment, and some men, they follow what? After. That stuff come out once you get there. Nobody knew about it, but it's open now. But God is fair because good works go up there too. Let's look at it. Verse 25, likewise also the what? Good works or some are manifest beforehand. You could see their life of good works. You said, boy, you're going to get a great reward from the Lord, and it's true. But what about the people who you don't know what they're doing for the Lord, but they're just as busy working for the Lord? You just don't know about it. It won't come out to them. Look what it says. Verse 25. Likewise, also the good works of some are manifest beforehand, and they that are otherwise cannot be what? Hey, what does it say? First Corinthians 4, who will bring to light the hidden things of darkness. Everything we do is going to come out into the light at the judgment seat. That's why it's so important. Now. Let's end. What, what, what did I say we got to end, Dodie? 2 Timothy 2. 2 Timothy 2. I was thinking about that this morning. When I get questions, I say if my questions increase tenfold, I'm going to get a lot of these type of questions I'm not going to answer. Verse number 23. 2 Timothy, we ended in this passage, 2.23. But foolish and unlearned questions, what do you do with those? I'm not answering them. I'm only going to answer sincere questions because notice what our apostle Paul says about these foolish and unlearned questions, but foolish and unlearned questions avoid knowing that they do what gender strife that, you know, some people it's called trolling today. Some people just ask you stupid questions just to get into a debate and have strife. I'm not the one. I don't do it. Why? I'm a servant of the Lord. Verse 24. And the servant of the Lord must not what strive. And when you're striving, you can't fit, fulfill this verse. But be gentle unto all men, apt to teach patience. Listen, you can be gentle, patient with people who you know have sincere questions. But if fools want to just battle you and contend with you, don't get into it. Because guess what it's going to lead to? You see it on social media. That's, it's, it's counterproductive. Now watch this, verse 25. Because God wants you to deal with it in the spirit of meekness, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. 
See, look, they're going against their own reward. If God peradventure, peradventure will give them what? Repentance. And what is that repentance designed to do? To the acknowledging of the truth that they may recover themselves out of the snare of who? The devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Listen, Satan, he wants you into this nonsense, so he got you captive. Oh, yeah. And what God wants you to do is get out of that, repent. By the way, it could be bad conduct or bad doctrine. Either extreme, okay? Galatianism, bad doctrine. Corinthianism, bad conduct. But the point is, God gives space to repent, and Mark will go through that stuff in detail from 2 Corinthians 7, okay? We'll pick up right there and then get into these next week. Lord, okay. We pray the Lord comes before then. Then Paul can teach us all about it. I'd rather sit under the Apostle Paul's ministry in person. My mother would say, the teachers, you know, I, I don't do, I, can't, I don't, you know, I don't look at people and stuff. And so I would sit in the back of the room in school and the teachers would call and says, you know, Ronald is, uh, he, he's smart, he answers these questions. But he always sits in the back. I was real shy. I, I, I didn't want to be up front. But it, if the Apostle Paul is teaching a class, I'm whooping somebody up to sit right where Dodie's sitting. I'll be right there. Me and Ryan, we're going to be fighting because I'm sitting right in front of the Apostle. <laughs> no, he could sit there. I'm going to sit right here. I'm going to be the teacher's pet, man. I'm going to be holding on to his leg, Jack. They wanted you to sit in the first row. I know they did, and I didn't want to. But for the Apostle Paul, I'll sit wherever he tells me I need to sit. I'll ask him, sir, may I sit to you right there? Can I just sit there and listen to you? you? Are you kidding me? He's my role model. Forget these athletes. My role model is a real man like me with, with sin in his flesh named the Apostle Paul. So if I get the privilege and honor to sit with that, with that man, with that brother, with our great apostle, I'm there, man. I'm there. And I pray we all feel that same way. And if you listen to Paul, through the, that's why I teach you his doctrine. You, your heart should yearn to have that too, okay? All right. If you've never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, nothing is required for salvation of your soul except trusting Christ alone in his death on the cross. He shed his blood for your sins. And if you're saved today, now it's all about the judgment seat of Christ. Church attendance is not required. No, but I went why it's important to optimize your reward. Is repentance required for saints? Yes, if you're living a willful lifestyle of sin, you don't care what God's word said. If it's weakness, we'll show you how to deal with that next time. That's a whole different story. And we'll look, out, look up the rest of these things next week if the Lord tarries. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time together this morning. We thank you that we can get into your holy, precious word, the holy scriptures, and study out the words you gave through the Apostle Paul. Because it is those things that makes us more than just a Pauline dispensationalist, but a grace believer. So Father, we thank you for this time this morning. May this time and the, the information that we get, get gained this morning take root in our hearts and bring forth the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ to the praise and glory of you. My prayer to saints is to those who don't have a local grace assembly, let them be a part of us from afar through their prayers and gifts. But for those of us who do have access to this Grace Local Assembly, which means we have greater, we have greater responsibility as joints that supply, may we appreciate it and uh, take advantage of it for your glory as well. And for ours, for our glory that you've given us. We thank you for all this in Christ's name.